Hey, what's happening, uh, everybody? So we are going over Ephesians 2 through Ephesians 13 this week, and uh, I know we're doing our Zoom meeting uh, on Thursday, but I just wanted to give you guys uh, just some teaching uh, on this passage, so that way whenever we get to hop in uh, on our Zoom, we can just hang out and talk, and then we can go through some questions and stuff like that, uh, and talk about what you guys have learned through the passage. But I've uh, done a sermon series uh, on the book of Ephesians before, and so I just wanted to uh, just walk through you uh, a quick teaching. I don't want to take too much time, uh, but uh, on these passages. So uh, first we'll start in Ephesians 2, uh, 11 and 12. It says, Therefore, that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. So the first thing I want you to see here is there's broken law, right? So uh, in the Abrahamic, uh, Mosaic, and even Pharisaical law, there's a thing called circumcision. Uh, and you guys probably already know what that is because you're adults. But um, so in this circumcision, that is this promise that is kept uh, throughout the Old Testament for God's people. That is a sign of their covenant with the Lord. And so there's this Abrahamic mosaic and this pharisaical uh, following of the law all the way through uh, the Old Testament, which then points out who is with God and who is outside of God. So we know that as Jew and we know that as Gentile. And Paul is talking about in this book, this, this dividing line between Jew and Gentile. So the Jews circumcised, Gentiles not circumcised, the uncircumcised, and now they are not a part of of the commonwealth of Israel. They were strangers at one point. There's a broken law that they can't be a part of the people of God. Why? Because they aren't following what God has commanded to do, essentially. So uh, you kind of move on in from that, but then we see more than just broken law on um, the Gentiles' behalf, right? Because the Gentiles even aren't a part of the family yet. They, they aren't even uh, a part of God's people, but the people of God, uh, the Jews, namely at the time, would have sinned as well. We know this as Deuteronomic history, right? Where you go read the Old Testament and God chooses his people and then he says, do this. And then they don't and then they get judged for it and, and they cry out to God and then God restores them and it over and over and over and over. And so the people of God are, are not foreign to sin as well. And so now we're going to talk about how this uh, this transition from being outside of the people of God and then into the people of God goes for us. And we see that uh, in verses 13 through 16. It says, But now in Jesus Christ, you who were, uh, you who once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for uh, he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two. So making peace, he might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby uh, killing the hostility. So the second thing I want you to see is blood links. And whose blood links what? Jesus' blood links us all together, Jew and Gentile. Now the people of God in the Old Testament who are exclusively the Jews, it is now opened up because of the blood of Jesus Christ that he shed in 33 AD, roughly, and it is now for everybody. And that's what this part of this passage is talking about. He's saying now the dividing wall of hostility is gone. Now we are not uh, two different people, but we are one people. We are, in, and, I, and I said this in a, in a Facebook post and you probably heard, or uh, Instagram post and you probably heard me say this, uh, plenty of times, but we are infused by the blood of Jesus. We are like family. We are family. No matter where we're from, no matter what color our skin is, no matter anything about that, if we are in Christ, we are infused by the blood of Jesus, and, so, and we are now a new people, a new race, a new man. And so that's what this part is talking about, and it's all through Jesus's sacrifice. And it's not that Jesus came to uh, essentially abolish the law, like it says here, it says uh, by abolishing the law of the commandments expressed in ordinances, what he's getting rid of is the following of the law expressed in ordinances, right? Jesus didn't come to, it says in Matthew 5, 17 through 18, not that he uh, has come to abolish the law, but he has 
uh, come to fulfill them. So he fulfills the requirement expressed through ordinances, expressed through the circumcision, expressed through all of these different A, B, C, D, E, F, G, 613 laws that the Pharisees would have kept and known, right? Now all of that is fulfilled. Jesus comes and he fulfills that. And now we are not held to that 613 law standard, but by grace you have been saved through faith. And when you know Jesus and when you love Jesus, when you love God and when you love your neighbor, all of that falls into what we are called to do. And when we love God and when we love our neighbor, we're going to do it. Why? Because it is for everybody now. His blood links us together. And so then we move on to this third point. Both loved ones, 17 through 19 in chapter 2. He came and preached peace to you who were once far off and peace to those who were near. For those, uh, for through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, in the household of God. We are all now a part of the household of God. We are all loved ones. Uh, I don't think there is any uh, traditionally Jewish people in our group, but we are all loved by God now. Once we were not a people, but now we are a people. And that's one of my favorite passages in all of scripture. It comes out of uh, Peter. Uh, he's saying that once you were not a people, now you are. Once you were called out, uh, one, once you were in darkness, now you've been called out of that into a marvelous light. You are now a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a special possession. And so I love that. And that now we Gentiles, all of us, no matter where we're from, are a part of God's kingdom. And so we move on into this uh, last portion of chapter two uh, is my fourth point, built firmly, built firmly. We are built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. We are built on a firm foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone. So we are built on Jesus and Jesus alone. Uh, and if we aren't, uh, it says that we are like fools who build our house on the sand. And when the water comes and when the wind comes, our house is going to fall. Man, how, how true is that in today? Man, are you standing firm in this time, being at home, being under quarantine, maybe uh, with the loss of job or school or anything like that? Like, how are you holding up? Are you built firmly on the prophets and Jesus and what he said in his word? Or are you being tossed to and fro? Is your house crumbling in? Man, well, I would encourage you, go build your house on the cornerstone. Go build your house on Jesus Christ. Pastor Kurt talks about that. Like being the church is being built on Jesus, right? And so we need that. We need to be firmly built on Jesus. And we see this all throughout scripture uh, is that he's called us to be the church. And we're gonna walk through some questions just about being the church. But I really challenge you to just think about uh, what the being the church means and, and what that means uh, to be in the church, how involved we should be in the church, what church looks like now, and all of that. Really evaluate yourself in this time uh, because uh, a lot of us are missing church. Well, why do we miss church? Evaluate these things. Uh, Sorry about that. My camera died in the midst of shooting, so now I had to change cameras and all that. So sorry if it looks different or weird. But uh, moving into point three, we are uh, now chapter three uh, in this next point. We are all partakers of the promise uh, and that is for this reason, I Paul, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on the behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that you were given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by the revelation as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So the mystery of the gospel has been revealed. The mystery of the gospel is that Jesus comes and he dies for us, and now we Gentiles are made a part of that. We are uh, partakers in the promise, fellow heirs to the kingdom. We are now royalty in God's kingdom, and now it is our job uh, for uh, us to foster the kingdom coming and, and live in this promise. And so what are the promises? Uh, I wrote down seven just really quick out of the book of John that we get to be partakers of as believers now. And it's Jesus's seven I am statements. The first I am statement is that Jesus is the bread of life and he offers satisfaction. The next thing is that he offers 
uh, to us that he is the light of the world uh, and we uh, don't walk in darkness anymore. Another thing is that he is the door for the sheep. Uh, we have a place to go into as his sheep that's safe and we get to walk through that door and be in his pasture. We get to partake in the promise of him being a good shepherd uh, and he lays down his life for us and we know that. We get to be a part of the promise of him being the resurrection and the life. I mean, we get to be a part of that resurrection and life. Why? Because Jesus died, was raised again, and now lives forever. So therefore, now we get to, if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth this promise, right, of this death and resurrection, now we get to be raised in new life. Six is this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Man, we have a way to follow, we have truth to follow in, and we have life uh, in Jesus. And then Jesus says, he says, I am the vine, and uh, you are the branches. Abide in me, and I in him. And, or excuse me, whoever abides in me and I in him, it is he that bears much fruit. From apart from me, you can do nothing. So with Jesus, we can do anything and we will bear much fruit. Those are just seven promises that Jesus gives us as partakers of this promise. And that comes out of the book of John. Then we move on to this next point, ministers on mission. We are ministers on mission, Ephesians 3, 7 through 11. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the word of his power to me, Though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone uh, what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God, who created all things, so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that has uh, that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace. We now have the same expectation. Matthew 28 talks about how we should go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Like, are you doing that? Uh, we are ministers on gospels, on, on the gospel mission, and we are ministers of Jesus Christ. And so uh, now we read in the Francis Chan book that we are all shepherds. We are all pastors in some capacity, right? Now, my job title is pastor. My job title is vocational minister and all of these things. But you in your workplace, you're meant to shepherd people. You in your small groups that you help lead for students, you in the children's ministry, you in worship or media, or even if you're not involved, like you should be shepherding somebody. You should be a minister on mission, sharing the gospel somehow, somewhere to somebody. So how are you doing that? And then we move into this last point is that we are made bold believers in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose your uh, lose heart over what I'm suffering for you, which is your glory in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. Are you living in this boldness? Are you sharing the gospel boldly? Are you uh, um, praying uh, in front of people boldly? Are you going out of your way to do things God's told you to do boldly? And so I ask you all these questions and I just give you this quick teaching and we'll hop on Zoom on Thursday uh, at seven o'clock and we're gonna get to talk about all of these questions and just what you learn in your own personal time. But I wanted to give you that just because, uh, you know, I love to teach and we won't have time to do it on Thursday night uh, in the uh, Zoom party. And so I just wanted to give this to you ahead of time. I love you guys and I will see you guys Thursday night.